Mm -hmm. Right, welcome to Family Bible Time. We are in <laughs> 1 Kings. <laughs> 1 Kings chapter <laughs> 7. <laughs> well, and we're in uh, Ephesians. Uh, so, let's pray. And let's go. <laughs> Father, thank you for um, spiritual food for our souls day by day. Thank you for getting us back in the Bible. And Lord, we praise you for the, the blessing that it is to us. We pray that you help us. Strengthen us now, Lord, to study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 1 Kings chapter 7. Currently I'm a beast. But we'll wait for you whilst you find your way there. 1 Kings okay. chapter 7. Solomon was building his own house 13 years. So, um... Just so that you feel better about it. <laughs> Our house is not taking quite so long, is it? No, no. Um, and he finished his entire house, which is very good. I'm bleeding again, am I? Sorry, I'm yeah, bleeding on camera now. Um, and he finished his own own his entire house. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, and its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits, and it was built on four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams on the pillars. It was covered with cedar <laughs> above the chambers. A big log cabin. A big log cabin, yeah. And, there, and it was covered with cedar above the chambers that were on the... 45 pillars, 15 in each row. There were window frames in three rows and window opposite window in three tiers. All the doorways and windows had square frames and window was opposite window in three tiers. And he made the hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits and its breadth 50, 30 cubits. There was a porch in front with pillars and a canopy in front of them. He made the hall of the throne. Are you getting a picture here? I mean, this is like a complex mm. of buildings. And you say, why does Solomon need a complex of buildings? Well, of course, he's, Solomon is, is, the, is the king at the head of a whole empire now. So... You've got all the people coming from all over the the kingdom of Solomon and they want to come and meet and there would be, you know, important gatherings and so on. So Solomon's making all these great halls for the gatherings. Um, it was finished with cedar from floor to rafters. His own house, where he was to dwell, in the other court, back of the hall was of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like his hall, like this hall, for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken in marriage. All these were made of costly stones, cut according to measure, sawed with saws, back and front, even from the foundation to the coping, and from the outside to the great court, the foundation was of costly stones, huge stones, stones of eight and ten cubits. And above were costly stones cut according to measurement and cedar. The great court had three courses of cut stone all around and a course of cedar beams. So had the inner court of the house of the Lord and the vestibule, vestibule of the house. And King Solomon sent and brought Hiram from Tyre. He, no, this is not King Hiram, that he was, this is another Hiram, he was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in bronze.
servants, and he was full of wisdom and understanding and skill for making any work in bronze. He, he came to King Solomon and did all his work. He cast two pillars of bronze, 18 cubits was the height of one pillar, and a line of 12 cubits measured its circumference. It was hollow, and its thickness was four fingers. The second pillar was the same. He also made two capitals of cast bronze to set on the top of the pillars. The height of the one capital was five cubits, and the height of the other capital was five cubits. And there were lattices of checker work with wreaths of chain work for the capitals on top of the pillars. You know what a capital is? Like a big bit at the top. Exactly. That's called a capital. Likewise, he made pomegranates in two rows around the lattice work to cover the capital that was on top of the pillar. And he did the same with the other capital. Now, the capitals that were on the top of the pillars were the, in the vestibule were of lily work, four cubits. Wow. The capitals were on the two pillars and also above the rounded projection, which was beside the lattice work. There were 200 pomegranates in two rows all around and so with the other capital. He set up the pillars of the vestibule and a uh, vestibule of the temple. He set up the pillar on the south and called its name Jachin and he set up the pillar on the north and called its name Boaz. Jachin and Boaz, the two names of the pillars. Interesting, isn't it? And on the tops of the pillars was lily work. Thus the work of the pillars was finished. What do you say to all of this? This must have been absolutely beautiful, by the way. I mentioned this the other day. That they're, they're really gearing up to rebuild the temple. It's, it's really incredible to see. I, um, I saw an interesting interview with a number of Jews and... Um, there's a, there is this movement in Israel to rebuild the temple on the Temple Mount. And um, the, the idea in the minds of the Jews is that the temple is going to be the place which will unite the religions of the world in worshipping the one God. And that's really interesting, isn't it? Mm. Because we believe that the, there's going to be an antichrist who's going to take his seat in the temple of God and proclaim himself to be God. And that all this religious unity that people say, oh, all the religions are the same, they all worship the same God. And, you know, we, if this were to come to pass in our lifetime, this would be um, a, a very serious sign that we are entering into the um, time when the Antichrist is going to be revealed. Anyway, that would be something to make you sit up and take notice. As I mentioned the other day, if they're going to actually rebuild this temple, and if you think I'm joking, just go and look it up. They are deadly serious. Um, you look, the, look up the Temple Institute. Then he made this sea of cast metal. It was round, ten cubits from brim to brim, and five cubits high, and a line of thirty cubits measured its circumference. Under its brim were gourds for ten cubits, compassing the sea all around. The gourds were in two rows, cast with it when it was cast. It stood on twelve oxen, three facing north, three facing west, three facing south and three facing east. The sea was set on them, and all their rear parts were inward. I like that verse. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know why I like that verse, but that's kind of funny. Its thickness was a handbreadth, and its brim was made like the brim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held 2,000 baths. That's not 2,000 baths like our bath in the bathroom. That's 2,000 measurements. Actually, now, a bath was about six <laughs> gallons. Six gallons is about 22 litres. So 
The bath was a, a fair amount of liquid, but it held 2,000 baths. That's, that's incredible. That's like 44,000 litres. That's a lot of water. He also made the 10 stands of bronze. Each stand was four cubits long, four cubits wide, and three cubits high. This was the construction of the stands. They had panels, and the panels were set in, in the frames. And on the panels that were set in the frames were lions, oxen, and cherubim. On the frames, both above and below the lions were, and oxen, there were wreaths of beveled work. Moreover, each stand had four bronze wheels and axles of bronze, and the four corners were supports for a basin. The supports were cast with wreaths at each side of at the side of each. Now, I mean, you enjoyed watching that video last night of a man making a bench, didn't you? I mean, it's just watching somebody do some real craftsmanship. His it's really, really fascinating. This, wow, can you imagine? Wouldn't you have loved to just stood there and watched them working? That would be incredible, wouldn't it? This must have been amazing. Its opening within a cr was within a crown that projected upward one cubit. Its opening was round, as a pedestal was made, is made, a cubit and a half deep, it, and its opening... At its opening there were carvings, and its panels were square, not round, and the four wheels were underneath the panels. The axles of the wheels were of one piece with the stands, and the height of a wheel was a cubit and a half. The wheels were made like a chariot wheel. Their axles, their rims, their spokes, and their hubs were all cast. There were four supports at the four corners of each stand. The supports were of one piece with the stands. And on the top of the stand there was a round band, half a cubit high. And on the top of the stand it stays and its panels were of one piece with it. And on the surfaces of its stays and on its panels he carved cherubim, lions and palm trees, according to the space of each with wreaths all around. After this manner he made the ten stands. All of them were cast alike, of the same measure and of the same form. Then he made ten basins of bronze. Each basin held forty baths. Each basin measured four cubits. And there was a basin for each of the ten stands. And he set the stand. He set the stands, five on the south side of the house and five on, five on the north side of the house, and he set the sea at the southeast corner of the house. Hiram also made the pots, the shovels, and the basins. So Hiram finished all the work that he did for King Solomon on the house of the Lord. The two pillars, the two bowls of the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars, the, and the two lattice works to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the tops of the pillars, and the 400 pomegranates for the two lattice works, two rows of pomegranates for each lattice work, to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the pillars. This is a bit like fine twine linen, isn't it? The ten stands and the ten basins on the stands, and the one sea and the twelve oxen underneath the sea. And don't forget, their rear parts were facing inwards. <laughs> Now the pots, the shovels, and the basins, all of these vessels in the house of the Lord, which Hiram made for King Solomon, were of burnished bronze. Now what does burnished bronze look like? Very shiny. Very shiny. People would make mirrors out of burnished bronze. If they did their shields and burnished them. Burnishing is to kind of polish it. So it would have just been, it would have looked like kind of golden, brownie coloured, bronzy, brownie coloured, golden, shiny, reflecting the light. What's up? I was thinking of contrasting. Oh, contrast. Okay. Okay. Very good. In the plain of the Jordan, 
the king cast them in the clay ground between Succoth and Zarathan. And Solomon left all the vessels unweighed because there were so many of them, the weight of the bronze was not ascertained. So Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of the Lord, the golden altar, the golden table for the bread of the presence, the lampstands of pure gold, five on the south side and five on the north before the inner sanctuary, the flowers, the lamps, and the tongs of gold, the cups, snuffers, basins, dishes for incense, and firepans of pure gold, and the sockets of gold. That's not sockets as in we have sockets on the wall. <laughs> It's like sockets for something to fit into. For the doors of the innermost part of the house, the most holy place, and for the doors of the nave of the temple. Thus all the work that King Solomon did on the house of the Lord was finished. And Solomon brought in the things that David his father had dedicated, the silver, the gold, and the vessels, and stored them in the treasuries of the house of the Lord. Wow. Mm. Treasuries. I mean, boy, this is just beyond imagination, mm. isn't it? How beautiful, how absolutely stunningly beautiful it must have looked. All covered in gold and with the smell of the cedar and the coolness of the stone. Mm. It just would have been the most amazing place. And tomorrow... It's going to become even more amazing, but that's for tomorrow. Mm. It's all empty, isn't it, without the Lord there. But tomorrow, the Lord is going to take up residence. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4. Mm. Wow, this is good stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 4. It's interesting as you read Ephesians. The first three chapters, really Paul is dwelling on our position in Christ mm. kind of like the, 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 all that God has done for us people point out that in the first three chapters the whole focus is, is on just like the realities that are ours because we're in Christ so if you're in Christ, if you're saved if you're trusting in Jesus and, and you're adopted into his family so you're in Christ in that sense and all these amazing things are true you, you have redemption the forgiveness of your sins you have access into the heavenly places you have this relationship with God you've been reconciled the wall of hostility is broken down between Jew and Gentile you're brought into this one body it's, an, it's just incredible everything that is yours when you're in Christ and so in the first three chapters of Ephesians, the whole focus is on kind of, okay, this is who you are in Christ. This is what God has made you in Christ. This is what you've become as you've been adopted, as you've been redeemed, as you've been forgiven. You were dead, you're now alive. It's all by grace. Now, all of that is what people that study language and theology called the indicatives statements of fact now in chapter four five and six we're moving on we're moving from the indicatives to the imperatives what's an imperative an imperative is a command so those are two moods indicative mood and imperative mood for a verb if the a verb is in the indicative mood it's just a statement of fact yes did you teach that in Harmonia? Not yet. Hmm. In the if it's last year I did, yes. But if it's if a verb is in the imperative mood, it's a command. So I could um I, I could just state something in English and say um she ducked. And, and you've just got a picture in your mind of someone ducking. But if I shout, duck, it's a command, you feel like you have to duck. That's an imperative mood to the verb. It's got a different mood to it, hasn't it? So just, one's just a statement of fact, she ducked. Another, another mood to the verb is the command mood, and 
in, in English you'd say it in a different way. You'd say duck. And so you, you duck. Um, oh, where's the duck? Now, in Greek, obviously, it's got different verb forms depending on the mood. And if you look at the chapter 4 onwards in Greek, again and again and again, you get these imperative verb forms, which are commands. So it's interesting because we're going from where we are, our position in Christ, to what we have to do, our practice in Christ. We're going from all the statements of fact to the implications of that for us. It's like, okay, well, if this is true about you, then this is how you should live. Now, you can't do chapter 4 to 6 without really chapter one, chapters 1 to 3 being true about you. Mm. People get that all messed up. They try to live the Christian life without dwelling on, without understanding, without knowing and relishing the facts about what it means to be a Christian. You can't do that. Paul didn't do that. He spent ages telling the Christians in Ephesus all about their great privileges, the blessings, the truths that were theirs because they're in Christ. And now he tells them about what they have to do. So buckle up, because we're going to have some imperatives. I urge, I, th- I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And when he says walk, he's not talking about what they do with their feet. He's talking about what they do with their life, isn't he? talking about their way of life. Mm. With all humility and gentleness and with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave, gift, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? That means he came down to the lower regions, the earth. He who descended, the one who came down, that's Jesus, is the one who has also ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry. The purpose of pastors and teachers, by the way, and evangelists is not just to do their work, it's to equip others to do work for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed about to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, Speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. Okay, stop there for a second. Just get something simple. It's not good to be immature. Mm. Now, you're growing up. And we praise God for that, don't we? Mm. There, there comes a point as you're growing up where you, you start to realise, ooh, I need to be a man or I need to be a woman. I can't just be a child anymore. And that's a good thing. Uh, we, we live in an age where children mm. don't grow up. It's not Peter Pan. It's not all good. It's the reality that boys become young men in age but they don't take up responsibility they stop they don't stop being immature and irresponsible Mm. and naive and careless 
And that, those are some of the characteristics of children, aren't they? Children need to be protected. Why? Because they're easily led astray. Children need to be directed. Why? Because they easily just follow their own impulses and do whatever they want to do. They don't think long term. They don't think that we, okay, we need to take responsibility here. But Paul is saying that's not good. And he's especially pointing it out in terms of Christians. Christians need to mature as Christians. It's possible to be an immature Christian and to stay that way. And that would be terrible. Because, well, then you're, you're, you're open to being led astray. You're, you're, you're not accomplishing what you need to accomplish. You're ready to be taken in by mm. human cun- cunning and craftiness and deceitful schemes. Mm. Instead of that, you need to be growing up in every way into, into him who is the head, into Christ, and and, and the key here is in verse 15, speaking the truth in love. And, and, and obviously the key also is the getting the teaching that you need and the equipping from the people who are gifted in that way, the pastors and teachers and evangelists and so on. Anyway, when, when that happens, when the good thing is when people do mature spiritually and they grow up spiritually, um, then the body causes itself to grow in love. This is a wonderful picture, isn't it? It's what we see happening increasingly in our own church. The more mature the body becomes, the more the body be- builds itself up in love because there's more and more and more people doing the work of ministry. It's just a wonderful picture. Mm. Okay, now verse 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous, and have given themselves up to sensuality and greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and was also corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Did you get that again? Verse 15 says, rather speaking the truth in love. Now verse 25 says, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Why? Because we're members of one another. We're one body. We're all in the same boat. We're part of the same family. We have to speak truthfully to each other, don't we? Okay, be angry, he says, verse 26, but, and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Can I just reread that? Mm. Because you didn't get it. I know some of you didn't get it. At least <laughs> some of you hear it but you don't think you actually have to do this. Mm-hmm. This, this, is, this is an imperative. This is a command. This comes from the mouth of Paul, from the pen of Paul, but it's inspired by the Spirit of God. Mm-hmm. So this is a command to you, if, if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian who's got all these blessings of chapters 1 to 3, now this is a rule for you. This is a law for you. You may not do otherwise and without disobeying your saviour. It's very simple. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, um, that means you have to solve it. That means you have to resolve it today. Doesn't it? That's great. It means the same day that you are angry, 
Mm. You have to let it go. Mm. You have to fix it. It, um, Seriously, if you just obeyed this, Mm. um, what a different world we would be living in. If if everyone in the church, if, if every married couple in the church just obeyed this, we pastors wouldn't have any marriage counselling to do, pretty much. It's just hard to be... It's hard to be... Um, to, it's hard to hold on to problems if you just refuse to hold on to your anger. Please, can I just say this to you? You go to bed angry, you have sinned. It doesn't matter what they've done. If you go to bed angry, you have sinned. I think I'm going to say it again. If you go to bed angry, you have sinned. <laughs> is that clear? Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, it's not difficult, is it? Mm. So what does Jesus say through his word here to you? Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, if you did, what would happen? Verse 27. And give no opportunity to the devil. Mm. Do you sometimes wonder why you fall into such a mess? Mm. Well... Don't give the opportunity to the devil. Verse 28, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labour, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Mm. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Mm. Now again, this is basic, isn't it? This is a command. This, this chapter is full of commands. Mm. And now he's saying, shut your mouth <laughs> unless you can say something which actually is going to build people up and give grace to people. <laughs> shut it. It's funny, isn't it? But he says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. How, how do you stop that from happening? <laughs> you've, got to sh- you've got to shut your mouth. <laughs> so if you can't talk in a way that builds, builds people up, shut up. It's simple, isn't it? Just shut up. Stop talking. Now, that's not an excuse for you to say, shut up, woman, or shut up, man, or shut up, child. It's an excuse for you to say, shut up yourself, isn't it? This is an excuse for you to say to yourself, shut up. There was a, a man who was converted under the preaching of Lloyd-Jones when Lloyd-Jones was preaching in Sandfields in... South Wales and they called him Staffordshire Bill he was a wild man a drunken man he'd wrecked his own house and uh, been kicked out of his house so many times for his drunkenness he had a foul mouth he couldn't open his mouth without swearing and he came I think to disrupt but the Lord got hold of him and he was saved and, Mm. and when he was saved he just he despaired. He just asked, like, I don't know how to talk without swearing. I can't open my mouth. I just don't know how not to do it. Well, he, he just shut up. So, yeah, if I, I'm not, if, I, if I can't talk without swearing, I'm just not going to talk. So he didn't talk for ages until he could control his tongue and say something useful. That's wisdom, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's the Holy Spirit at work. And now, if you think that's not significant, look at verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. You just talking and letting anything come out of your mouth can have the capacity to grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamour and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another tender-hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you what's the standard Mm. all right look at yourself how amazing is the forgiveness that you have given me God Mm. all right that's how I have to forgive everyone else Mm. that's how you let the sun go down having got rid of your anger you think about your sin and the way God forgave you, and then you forgive like that. That's how you do it. Mm. You tender-hearted, kind, forgiving, with in view the forgiveness that God forgave you with. All right.
Father, we pray that that would be us. We pray that you'd cause that to characterise this home more and more and more. Thank you for the measure that you've given us. Please give us more, more of this grace, more of this quickness to forgive. Lord, have mercy upon us, we pray, and uh, be gracious to us, we pray, and to all the church, Lord. Transform us by your love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, that was Ephesians chapter 4. This is good stuff, Amen. isn't it? Hope you didn't get lost in the building of the temple and tune out if you did. You missed it, didn't you? That was good stuff. We'll see you again tomorrow, God willing. Goodbye. Goodbye and God bless.